All right, welcome to the 2021 Women in Music Speaker Series by Ada Sigma. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Professor Shi'i Wu. Honored to be here. Um, today is uh, one of those really beautiful days, sunny and not too hot in Chicago. I'm joining you from Northwestern University in my office. Um, I'm very excited to uh, spend a, some time to, to talk about music, actually, and hopefully there will be education involved and other things. But um, I want to start by just talking a little bit of my, uh, about my background, because it's slightly kind of kind of different, I suppose. Um, I was born in Taiwan. I uh, was raised uh, by my mother. Uh, somewhat of a from a low-income family um, my mother really believes in arts and education uh, maybe because she didn't have that background uh, growing up so she uh, really wanted me to to have music in my life and I tried dance trust me I just I just couldn't even I, I, that's not for me I, I, <laughs> I I'm not really coordinated in that sense and so um, one day I was walking down the street and with my mom and we were going home and and there was a music store you know and I was I was I see all these children and a lot of music coming out there's a glass door and I, I thought well just I, I was just really curious and I was fascinated and it's so I had not seen those instruments before I was three and a half years old and the next thing you know is like my face was like literally, you know, kind of taped to the to the glass door, and I refused to leave. And my mother's like, oh, "Do you want to go in?" Yes, 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 yes. So I, <laughs> she let me in, and that's pretty much the end of my uh, <laughs> end of the sort of non-music right life, because from that point on, I I, I couldn't stop. And I was in the store, and, and you know, I was playing the piano, I was doing all those little drums, and and then so I, I was having a great time. And so this lady, you know, comes over to me and my mom and said, uh, "We have a you know a class for you know people to start you know at age four. And my mother really wanted to do this, but she didn't have the uh, the means to do it. So she said, you know, we, she's, she's actually three and a half, so she's not ready to do this. And so this, this uh, woman said, well, you can just bring her, you know, maybe she would be just fine. And uh, my mother said, we, we actually can't afford it. We'll, we'll try to make some plans and, and join in the future. And this lady said, why don't you just bring her? No charge. Just, just bring her. She, she looked like she was having so much fun. So can you believe that? That they let me in? Seriously, every Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, I was attending this music class. My mother uh, doesn't, is not musical. Is, uh, she, she listens to music, but she's, um, she's not musically trained. But she accompanied me to the class every, every Sunday. So that happened. So one day, when I was six, she said, it's okay, today's the day. And she's looking at me and I'm going, okay, because she, she looked different that day. She said, I'm going to get you a French horn lesson. Today's the day. I've been waiting because this is my favorite instrument. That was my mother's favorite instrument. And I was looking at her going like, well, I've never seen my mom this excited. You know, we don't even celebrate birthdays. So, okay, I, I guess I will go, you know. But you know what? After an hour of <laughs> spitting and doing all that, I couldn't make any sound. Seriously. And so the teacher, come on, I was six. Gotta give me a break here. But the teacher said, well, I'm not sure your daughter is cut out for the horn. And she, my mother was very disappointed. And then she said, took me home and she said, well, what would you, uh, what would you like to learn? I, I think I can take out a loan and, you know, try to like get an instrument. Anyhow, I, I said timpani. Timpani. My mother said, timpani. You don't even know what timpani is. I said, I do. They are big drums in the back in the orchestra. I've seen them. And my mother's like, 
but you're not even tall enough. I was tiny. I'm I'm five two at the moment. So imagine how small she goes. I can't. I, you can't reach the. T I was like, I want to learn how to play a timpani. So that was over. From that point on, I was a percussionist. She found me a teacher. Uh, I practiced on a sofa for probably three years. So one day my teacher said, hey, what kind of timpani you have at home? Just curious, you know? And I said, I'm looking at my mother, and I said, uh, my couch. And he could not believe it. He said, no way. All this etudes and all that you practice on the couch? I said, y yeah. I. And you know what's amazing? That probably helped with my touch, you know? Because... You, you kind of have to make the sound. You have to think about the sound. So anyway, um, she eventually got a set of practice timpani for me. And, and, and from that point on, I started learning percussion instruments, other percussion instruments, like snare drums and xylophones and, and all other things. And um, I, I was really into music. I told my mother that I wanted to go study ab abroad. And, you know, she can, you can only imagine, right? She looked at me, she was like... I'm not sure that's possible. We can afford it. So she worked three jobs to 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 help me to go to school. So um, if so, somebody always. I mean, you heard this before. It's always like somebody, sometimes sometimes a man or woman or, or whoever. It's always somebody that is that that is really persistent and supportive and and would do anything to help their child, you know, and that's my mother in my life. So as somebody, that's sort of like a little background, then I, then I went to college and then I got my master's and before I graduated, I was, um, I got a job at West Virginia University as a system, a tenure track assistant professor and that was a while ago. And since then I taught at Rutgers for 10 years and then now been at Northwestern for 13. Um, so that's then. As someone who uh, travels the world and play, I perform as a soloist. I play with orchestra. I teach master classes. I judge competitions. I compose. I conduct. I host symposiums. I host middle school camps. I'm on the board for Percussive Arts Society. I'm on the faculty board here uh, at Northwestern. I also travel a quarter of a million miles a year pre-pandemic. Now, what does that mean? Around the world is uh, 25,000 miles. So yearly, I travel 10 times of that. I wanted to let you know that because it is amazing to see the world that way through music, whether it's Greece, whether it's Finland, whether it's South Korea, whether it's China, whether it's Louisiana, Scotland. But being a soloist, really is not what everybody thinks it is. Do, do, you know, do you know that as a soloist, you have to be alone all the time? And I didn't really know that until I became one. You practice in, in a room by yourself, whether it's big or small. You, you, you go to the airport by yourself. You're at the airport alone with a lot of other people, especially in Chicago. But you're literally alone, right? You're on a plane alone, and you're somebody pick you up. You're in the limo, whatever car it is, and going to the hotel or going to the hall alone, in the green room alone. You're on 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 the stage alone. After the concert, you're alone in the hotel room, and this just continues to, you know, cycle through. And so it is not as perhaps glamorous uh, or cool. It is, but it, it also, there are sacrifices that come with a career like this. Because I cannot be frank. I mean, who, who would want to be a, in a relationship with somebody like me who travels so much that barely home? Do you know what I mean? And so there is that part of it, being a performer. I, I, I get to meet a lot of people on, on the road, and I get to see a lot of places that, I couldn't imagine seeing. And but I see the same issues everywhere, uh, every country that I go. I see students that weren't able to learn. I see 
some students like no access to instruments and equipment. Uh, I see students weren't taught properly, uh, lack of pedagogy or curriculum, lack of mentorship. I see all that. It's it's universal. It's not just our country. It's it's universal. And as an educator, I I think being a teacher is a noble profession. It's not for the weak. It's not just about providing the students the knowledge, but it is t the following. I'm going to talk about one at a time. Cultivate their curiosity. Now, I said that first because if you are curious about something, you will explore all sound possibilities. I'm wondering if I play like this, what would it sound like? If I play here, what would it sound like? If I use this to play, what would it sound like? If I uh, play like that, what would it sound like? If I think something else, would it sound like that? Or if I think about beach, would it sound beachy? Do you know what I mean? Like, curiosity is your best asset, and it's not an app to download to cultivate that. But it comes really you could cultivate that. It comes from, you could guide them through in, instead of deductive teaching. This is how you hold the stick and this is how you play. And you play here, you play this much ahead, you know, on top of the blah, 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 blah. You give them all these rules. I believe, I, I do believe in pedagogy methods. But at the same time, if, if they're only limited to do only this, then they would not think of outside the box. So I think as a teacher, it's not just providing them knowledge, it also expand their mind and teach them how to learn about themselves, about how to teach, how to think. Like you can, you, you can play a phrase so many different ways. Like, how are you? How are you? How are you? Right? If a phrase could be expressed in so many different ways, same as music. And so it's not like, well, you have to say it like this. You have to, I mean, yes, you, you do have to ask them to learn how to play fundamental. They have to have strong fundamentals and scales and all that. Yes, they do have to learn how to play the instrument properly, hold the, hold the bow and all that. But how to think is, I think it's crucial. Um, equip them with skills to problem solve anything. That could be. I could phrase this way, I could conduct this way, I could I could explain it this way. Hmm, they don't seem to understand this. Okay, maybe the modality is different. Maybe they learn from visually, so I have to demonstrate. Maybe they're learning from listening, so I have to play it for them. Maybe they they respond really well using different words. We're all built so differently, we're created differently. Yes. And so I think that's important to 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 give them the skills so so they can problem solve. And it's also about being there for them. Whether it's one o'clock in the morning, numerous times, I'm, I practice at school in my office throughout the night. So I know all the janitors. But I will say frequently, not like every day, but you know, before pandemic, I will hear the knock like that. One o'clock in the morning, can I talk to you? They know I'm practicing because they can hear it. My door is always open if I'm here. And so it's being there for them. Sometimes they're, you're the only one they got. And sometimes you're the only person that can take care of them. I've been to hospitals um, through different positions. I, I was the only one there. I had to take them to the hospital or I have to be there. I have to go visit them because their parents weren't there or they didn't have somebody who can come uh, visit them, assign papers. But it's also about maximizing their full potential, whatever that is, so they can go out of the world and be of use and contribute to our society. And um, I will say one thing is very interesting, being at Northwestern, 85% of the undergrad students are dual degrees, so percussion performance and mechanical engineering, civil engineering, uh, f 
physics, math, psychology, anything. And so some of them, some of them would choose to go into engineering as their, their other discipline. So one of them told me one time, he's a mechanical engineering major, sat in my chair, came in to tell me he got a job. He was still in school. And you know what he said? I said, how was your interview? Talk to me. You know what he said? Y you would not believe this. They were like, what is the most memorable prob problem solving experience you had? Now this is an interview for an engineering job, right? You know what he answered? He said, it's about this multi, a multiple percussion piece that I had to s tackle. And every single piece that I don't know if you know this, but I'm sure some of you have seen there's a lot of instruments, you know, bongos and cowbells and toms and tam tams, and you're surrounded by instruments, yes. And there is sometimes set up from by suggested by the composer, but sometimes that doesn't work for you. And so you have to come up with your own way of setting up that works for you. According to passages, some of the pieces don't have any of that setup charts, and so you have to come up with a way to to move efficiently and be able to make phrases that make music a certain way. And they were totally floored because he he talked about his experience in music. Now, as a, a, a I, I am I have to say a little bit about this as, as a, a woman in percussion um, I, I you you have to know this right this is not like an elephant in the room and nobody can talk about is I think there are less than 30 full-time 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 percussion professors in United States like at a university level I was trying to count and I, I got up to 22 and then I kind of stopped because there are people that I know but then I don't remember their names and then they're teaching as North Dakota I met them once and um, it is a male dominated uh, field and so I have never been mistreated or disrespected uh, because of who I am but I do have to say that no matter what job no matter what interview no matter what competition no matter whatever it is I, I think our goal should always be you have to be really prepared, like really prepared and really qualified. And for my interview here at Northwestern, I, I don't know if you know this, but normally they will bring three candidates for the final round after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people apply they they look at their resume experience and all that and then it come down to three that is normal like a common uh, for all universities but somehow for my position uh, they have five because the uh, the person before me built up the program really really well so they really want to make sure that they uh, get the right person i suppose so out of those five people, there are two women, right? But out of the five people, there are three people that have doctorates. I did not have a DMA because I started teaching when I was 23. And so from every point of view, and I didn't graduate from here, three out of five, gradu three out of five graduated from here. You see what I mean? And so you have heard this before. Ah, they're going to hire their own people. Oh, you know, they know so-and-so, blah, 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 all that. And I was like the, I guess, the, the wild card. And, and just, to, just to say that I, I didn't care about any of that, the fact that I didn't have DMA, the fact that I, uh, I didn't graduate from here, I didn't know anybody, that, was, that never entered my mind. I, I came here to, to teach those students and to play. I, I literally think about that as like, I, I, I'm, I am not going to get myself into thinking about oh, all those complications and all that. I, that's, that doesn't really help you to interview better, does it? It's just like uh, students sometimes where I, I was asked all the time by all the master classes I've done all over the world, they always said, do, do you get nervous when you play? And then I said, I get very excited. 
if you mean by nervous as a negative thing, that means maybe you're not prepared. Because if you're really prepared, you would be confident. Like, you know, I really do know the speeds. I know how to do this. And I practice. I study every note. I, I know the form. I know the harmonic progressions. I know everything about this piece. Then there's nothing else to think about other than go play and be you. I am going to share a story as my last uh, thing to, to as, a, as a sort of conclusion. Um, I was once uh, doing a class at, um, in a town, a small town near Monroe, Louisiana. That area is a, it's an area that the, the students go to school, kids go to school just to get fed. I did my class. After the class, they all came to me, wanted me to sign, but they have nothing to sign, for me to sign. They have no drums, no sticks, no mouths, no nothing. They have nothing. Um, they want me to sign on their arms, on their face. I said, I can't do that. In their palms so they can see, on their shirt, on their shoes. I have pictures of me signing those things. And they were like, can't you not leave? Are you coming back next week? They were so cute. And I, after that experience, I, I, I suppose I experienced the power of education. And I told myself, you know, I have to make time. I have to make time to reach out to as many students as possible, especially those in need. And so I started partnering, uh, like being a partner with certain band directors in California, in Georgia, in Texas, in def different places to, to start like middle school camps for, for students that can't afford to, to go to school um, and create and provide an op uh, opportunity and an environment for them to learn. And I think that we need to do our part and contribute and create this movement and if you have any doubt whether you can do it, the answer is yes, you can. If a kid like me, raised by a single parent with a low income family, could do this, you can too. Um, I'll take some questions. I have a question. So I, I loved your story from how you said like your mother really did everything that she could to kind of help you like bring you into this position. I thought that was really enlightening. And like, do you find yourself giving back to other people in ways that remind you of your mother? Yes, Madison, you're like nailing it. Yeah, I, I feel that I, I want to be that person. If I, often I, I see very supportive parents, but sometimes I, I don't. Their parents don't want them to go into music. They're doing it, they're dual degreeing because they have to. They want to do music, but they have to do this other thing to please their parents, so therefore they do dual degrees, that kind of thing. And sometimes I, I, I see students don't have means to attend certain things and um, I try to help him as much as I can, and I do feel that. And I also have a mentor from my college time. With, without this person, my teacher, Bob Shutroma, he's since retired. I went to North Texas, um, University of North Texas. Without this person, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't even be alive, to be honest. I, you know, <laughs> I have done... <laughs> Uh, things that I'm not proud of and I've done dangerous things that I shouldn't have done and knowing what I know now had he not in intercept I, I I probably wouldn't be alive actually so I owe it to my mentor and my my mother and I hope to be I can't I can't imagine being the influence like like them to me but I hope to be helpful and supportive and 
in any way I can. And then I think that's part of being an educator. Thanks for the question. No problem. Thank you for answering. I, I do think that um, the people that you interact with every day will, you'll, you'll have an impact on them in ways that you may never know, but I think they're always good impacts. Wow, I didn't think I, no, no questions for me? <laughs> I have a question. Please, please. Um, so you said that um, solo life um, was pretty hard um, and it's not like maybe as glamorous as it seems to some people. But I was wondering, is there anything that like is like something that kind of like a perk that like, if like, you know, traveling and being like solo on your own? Uh, can, can you phrase the last part again? I uh, couldn't hear it clearly. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so, um, is there anything to like the solo life, like traveling on your own, that is kind of like a little bit like a perk that maybe like I don't know, I don't know anything you could think of. I was just wondering because like you said that it wasn't necessarily as glamorous, but I was just wondering if there's anything that was like pretty like cool or neat to it. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm so sorry that if I I made that impression, it is cool. I, I get to see, I mean, I went to Santorini and to the Greek islands because I was playing in Athens. And so my friend said, you have to take the boat, you have to go there. Of course, I went to Santorini by myself. It's like the number one destination for engagement, you know, everywhere else I see. And I'm there just looking at the sunset by myself, for example. And my first time I've been to Paris, maybe. 30 times now but the first time I was in Paris I was so excited but my suitcase didn't show up right and so I had to go shopping and I was asked I can't speak French unfortunately and so everybody's like oh, go to the Pantone do the gallery Lafayette you know is this just where you should go shopping of course and then I was like yeah okay um I, I went shopping, but then uh, after my performance, I remember this. I was like, I felt like walking. So there I was, never been to Paris my first time. I was walking, you know, and then I saw the opera, you know, the, the old opera building was like, ah, oh, so beautiful. I kept walking. I saw the Louvre, like just by getting lost. And then I, <laughs> after seeing the Louvre, you know, I, I saw the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Seriously, if you know what I'm talking about, I was like, I was walking by just like, oh, there's the Eiffel Tower. Wow. So it is very cool. It's so cool that that I am not gonna lie, but it it does come with some sacrifices, like I mentioned. So it, it is really cool. But if you can handle the other part that comes with it, it just feels so alone all the time. Like literally all the time if you can handle that then you could probably take on that that direction thanks for the question <laughs> that was thank fun thank you for answering <laughs> uh, Professor, one more question i have a question and then uh, malcolm also had a question so he'll yell it after i'm done okay. um what was your favorite place to go and what is your least favorite place to go from your soloing adventures? I don't have them. Because each, each place, whether it's Scotland, or whether it's Finland, whether it's Denmark, whether it's Norway, whether it's, you know, not, not the major cities in China, which you can see poverty, uh, Portugal, Spain, um, it, it's it's all very interesting to me. It's just it, it's human life. I I, I, I really I, I really like seeing the way the like in Spain, for example. Do you know that the concert starts at midnight? I'm not joking. My first time in in, in Madrid, I said, "Oh, so so the concert is eight o'clock." They were like, "Oh no, oh, oh no no no." So I mean we. I've been up all day teaching whatever it is. Okay, siesta. You take a nap, so you get up, you refresh, and so the concert starts at twelve. They were still drinking, 
in the lobby. It didn't really start until 12.30, for example. And so I didn't finish playing until almost 2. Then we go out to eat until 4 something. And one of them says, let's go to disco. I was like, I can't. I have to get up. And <laughs> so it's just like, just, just they live. They really live. I mean, it's incredible. And it's just, and just the culture in every country is so different. I, I don't, I don't have that. I really enjoyed traveling through uh, doing what I do. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a like one answer for you because I was like, man, I really like Italy too. I really like Finland. I really like Finland. I somehow relate to that country for some reason. But Yeah, there was no right answer to that, but you gave the right answer, so. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I couldn't choose one. <laughs> it's all good. Um, if there's no other questions, I think Malcolm's moved on from his question. Um, I'm going to stop the recording so it's nice and easy, and I'm going to upload this to YouTube so people can watch this, if that's okay. And I will uh, hang around until the end, and if we can maybe have a little panel discussion, that would be fun. Got it.